Well, welcome back, Reg audience. Today we are building an open cloud. Well, we're not actually building it. We're going to leave that to you afterwards. But hopefully we will give you some good advice and some pointers on A, why you should be doing it and uh, B, how you go about it. So uh, let's get on with that today because we are saying no to silos. Why are we saying no to silos? Well, a lot of you, as we know from the, the research, you have been um, building your proprietary clouds. The problem is, what are you going to do with that? You're ending up with some cloud so silos. So uh, what are we going to do about that now helping me today? Obviously, we've got the Reg Vulture in. He's back again today. I was very popular with you guys, probably more popular than the rest of us. Um, also, you will be helping us with this. Remember that uh, there are two things to remember today. First, it, ask questions as usual. Uh, three things actually. Second thing is you can get these slides uh, on a PDF if you want them. Don't get them now, it'll spoil the surprise. But the third and the most innovative and unusual thing is that today, we don't normally do this, but we've got a poll for you. That's running down at the bottom of the screen, so you'll see it underneath me. Uh, the, no, you'll see it that side of me at the moment and uh, so uh, you'll see it underneath me and um, but you can see it I can't that's that's the point here answer the question we'll be explaining a little bit about the question in a few minutes time so maybe leave it until then we'll give you the results at the end please though ask your questions all the way through so Who's helping us with this today? First up, our guest in the studio, Peter from HP. Peter. Morning, Tim. Welcome to our studio. What do you do at HP? Um, so I work in our Helion cloud business in HP, and I'm responsible for a couple of different uh, sales segments in the market. So responsible for the product and, and how, we, uh, how we help customers with it. Now, what's this Helion cloud business? Um, so, so a Helion is our uh, is our brand for all of our cloud solutions that we sell in the market. So that incorporates both the software and also um, a number of the services and the managed offerings that we take to market. This is a new name, isn't it? It's a new name and it's a big investment from HP, uh -huh. a big commitment to OpenStack. Um, and I think it's, you know, it's part, part of the journey we're going on as an organisation to help our clients. Yeah, okay. I'm surprised Helion was available as a brand name, suggest the sun or... Yeah, well it actually stands for effectively a doubly positively charged neutron is the... Uh, that upsets, uh, upsets and uh, changes the parameters of things. So uh -huh. that's, that's really our... Uh, that's your... Uh, yeah. That's, yeah, which what, we're, that's we're, what they told you when they launched. Absolutely. That, that's, that's, what, that's what the agency told us. Bart. I'd love to be a branding... <laughs> I'd love to be a branding consultant. Yeah. Now, and also, uh, joining us from Freeform Dynamics, Dale, welcome back. Thanks, Tim. You're looking Good very video. healthy these days. That was a little bit of sun. Good British sunshine. Yeah, yes. Nothing wrong with that. Absolutely. Well, good. You're in the studio now. You can't go out in the sun for another hour. <laughs> um, good. And uh, I will be here as well asking your questions when I come in. I've got little, these days, because we don't have laptops in front of us anymore, which is so much better. But these days I have a little screen down here. So your, your questions still do come to me. Uh, now, Dale, why are we here talking about this now? Because we hear a lot of vendors uh, IT vendors and service providers out there um, promoting very heavily this idea of cloud first in that you should be looking to put all of your IT assets and all of your services into someone else's data center. Reg readers, on the other hand, don't really go along with that view. Mm -hmm. They basically say, look, we, we, we know that cloud is important. Um, most of them do anyway. Uh, we can see a place for it. Um, but actually, the hub for everything we do is really on-premise IT. So we want the point of control in the data center. And that, that's how we get to this notion of hybrid cloud, which we're going to be talking about a little bit as we go through this. Mm -hmm. um, well, one of the problems which I think we'll be talking about as well as we go through is um, the fact that because really it, it, it cloud has been, hosted cloud at least, has been viewed as a pretty tactical thing. It's been a quick solution to a problem. Um, people have accumulated different clouds um, or numerous clouds and, and that, as we'll come on to in a minute, um, raises certain issues. So this is something that a lot of people are now starting to um, pay attention to because there, there, there are a bunch of issues that have just snuck up on them uh, over the last three years or so in particular. Peter, do, when, you, uh, when you get in front of 
uh, potential cloud users, is there a certain amount of cynicism to people saying, oh, I've heard all this sort of stuff before, vendors promising us the earth if we just move to a whole new idea of things yeah. that you could sell us? I think like any new technology trend, there is a challenge where, where the perception is very different from reality. Um, and there's lots of different people talking about cloud-based solutions and automation, but actually behind the scenes, they're delivering very little of that. Um, so, so yes, that's a challenge. Um, I, I think, you know, our philosophy at HP is pretty simple, is that we're trying to put the IT team back in control of where the resources sit so we can get the right workload at the right place at the right time. And that's, um, that's all of our investments that we're making are centred around that as a, a kind of a strategy. Well, let's have a look at that because we've got, uh, we've got a slide for this. There we go. Um, it's it. And there it is with your, your little Helion logo. Yeah, with a fantastic <laughs> logo on there. Yeah. So, so let me let me start off and talk a little bit about that in terms of a, you know, what what, what we announced and and I guess uh, you know the, the the advantages that we bring into the market. So first of all, we launched the, the Helion brand on the seventh of May. Um, it was a very significant investment for HP. So we invested nearly, or we've agreed to invest over a billion dollars over the next two years. Um, which is almost 30% plus of our R&D budget as an organisation. That's so, just your salary. Uh, I, I, unfortunately, <laughs> it's not, no. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I, I guess you know, it's a big investment um, and a big focus area for us. And, and, and not only did we announce um, some new products and offerings behind it, but we announced a significant commitment to the OpenStack um, community and portfolio. And that is a big centre of what we're doing inside HP. Okay, so why this? Why have we got this slide here then? What's this left to right that you've got these four different clouds? So, so we're trying to um, sit down with customers and, and analyse whether we're taking a build and operate model or a consumption based model in terms of our workloads. So if you think about, you know, kind of putting the IT team back in control, we want to put them in the middle of this uh, in the middle of that arrow, if you like, to choose where the workload sits based on their SLAs, their understanding of the business. That's really our direction. And, and what we feel is that there'll be, there'll be some workloads that will sit traditionally and well in a private cloud um, because I need maximum resiliency, fantastic security. I've got some compliance um, challenges to overcome. And there'll be other workloads where I want to move towards a, a managed instance where I offload the challenges to somebody else to run it for me. And whether that's on a dedicated platform or on a shared platform isn't really important at the moment, but we, we give the option for the customer to move it over. And then I guess on the far right hand side, you've got what we're doing in the, or what we and other vendors are doing in the public cloud, which is the true, true consumption model, i.e., pay per VM per hour, uh, pay per gigabyte per hour, etc. So that's kind of the when we talk about the build and operate and the consumption, that's what we mean, that the difference is between the two in, in the market. Now, is it important that the IT department stays in control? Yes, it, it is for, for a number of reasons. Um, firstly, uh, a, a lot of rhetoric might kind of suggest that there's something magic about cloud that makes all kinds of IT problems go away. Um, but actually, uh, in most cases, it, it makes things a bit more complicated because um, You've got more moving parts. You've got more options. I mean, the options on this slide are, are actually pretty important, and I would I would argue that most of the action at the moment around cloud is towards the left of that chart, but it's gradually moving towards the right. So it's and we're going to see a, a kind of evening out across that. Meanwhile, off to the left of this chart, not actually on this chart, you've got traditional IT systems mm. that are still in place and are going to remain in place for for decades. Um, and everything needs to be coordinated across those. And with the best will in the world, business people that don't have that kind of technical technology expertise, architecture expertise, are not going to be able to achieve the kind of coordination necessary. And, and therefore, you're going to run into problems. Uh, when you work with these kind of business people, do you find that they are very aware of where their workload should be at any particular time? Um, they're, they're, what's very interesting is when you look at where their workloads are, um, m most of the, the activity at the moment is off to the left of this chart, so it's not actually in the cloud world, it's still mm. in the traditional world. Um, and then it's kind of moving more towards the, the, the right-hand side. When you look at, um, I, mean, I run lots of workshops uh, where we, we help people kind of figure out where, where they're going, so where the, you know, what's their roadmap um, and, and where they're going to end up. And one of the notions that we have is, Where's the point of equilibrium? So, so where are you going to get the right kind of balance between all these different um, delivery models? 
And when we go through that kind of workshopping process with particularly large organisations, we find that you end up with workloads and applications in pretty much every bucket. I tend to use a, being an analyst, I use a quadrant approach as, uh, as you might guess. And yeah. so we, we have things in every box, um, which basically is a you know, long way of saying that people want to keep their options open and there are legitimate reasons for keeping their options open for some of the reasons Peter mentioned and, and others. And I think probably the, to, to maybe expand on that, the, the, the bit that makes it work is creating a common architecture underneath. And that's why we've made such a big bet on OpenStack. Um, because actually this, this hybrid vision, um, you'll probably see from other vendors. So I'm sure if you had Microsoft or VMware in here, they would be talking about a similar approach. Mm. Um, however, you, you're unable to do that unless you, unless you create that common standards across the bottom. And I think, importantly, we, we're not suggesting that public cloud is the wrong answer inside HP. For certain workloads and certain requirements, it's absolutely a fantastic yeah, absolutely. answer. I think the, the proliferation of it in the in the commercial market at the moment is a real challenge because I think it's being used when there's other better alternatives. And it's also being used outside of the IT team, which is, a, which is another major challenge. And let's be fair, it's still pretty immature. I mean, just a few weeks ago, we saw um, uh, various players, Google suddenly followed by Amazon and then um, Microsoft, you know, all kind of going through this price adjustment in terms of public cloud, mm. uh, which is just an indicator that at the moment, the market's still pretty kind of up and down in terms of um, uh, maturity. We, we, we've not really got to a point where we know what these environments are going to look like, how much they're going to cost, what the cost models are, um, and I think you know there's probably two or three other adjustments to come as as time goes on. So that, that's important to bear in mind. So and, uh, yeah, and and yet here's the thing because I, I want to show yeah this because this kind of point, where we are now. A lot of uh, a lot of people watching this will have already made some sort of baby steps, or or maybe some quite large investments. Yeah. In these technologies that you're saying are not mature yet. Yeah, and this is this is really a um, a, a sort of drill down on one of the things we mentioned a, a minute or so ago, which is that you know you accumulate clouds. That that's really what this this chart is saying. So internal clouds that um, you know they might be based on different kinds of technologies. So you mm. you've got a cloud based on one uh, vendor's stack and then another cloud based on another vendor's stack and then clouds that are um, geared up for different reasons, you know, highly resilient, highly performant, general general purpose for, you know, managing the window sprawl, that kind of thing. So clouds have different characteristics. So legitimately you're going to end up with different clouds um, and people have already ended up with multiple instances of internal clouds, which may or may not be, be based on the same underlying uh, technology stack. And then over on the right hand side, and this this to me is probably the, the more difficult problem because on the left, if you're going to build a private cloud, at least you've got, to date, at least you've had to put a lot of thought into it. Yeah. And that, 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 that sort of gives you time to think about where it's going. But on the right hand side, you can very, very quickly sign up to these public cloud services. And um, the, the, these things have uh, not been particularly well controlled. So it's been a very reactive kind of adoption of, of, of public cloud to solve problems as they've arisen. So that, that means people very often are sitting on not just multiple services from the same provider, but services spread across multiple providers. And you know it's very unlikely that a single provider is gonna be able to solve all of your cloud problems. So you're gonna be living with a certain amount of that, but at the moment it, it, it's actually quite fragmented. And, and we're saying that these servers, these services don't play well together. Not, not always. Now, now we, we said that you know, maturity is, is, is a bit of a problem with uh, public cloud services at the moment. Standards are evolving in that space, so you're going you're gonna to see a little bit more in the way of interoperability and um, uh, migration capability. But in the meantime, you need to do something uh, about that. Um, if you stand back from this and you say, well, you know, we, we need to reduce the amount of fragmentation, that, 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 that's an aim. Um, but we're always going to have a, a, a level of distribution, let's say, um, of, of clouds and, and multiple clouds. So from an architectural perspective, we, we need um, uh, a foundation in place which allows us to manage that kind of distribution, those multiple clouds. And I think that that's important because actually you only get, you know, we, we've gone to the market with this grand ambitions around cloud economics and how it's going to you know, improve and reduce the cost of IT. But, but that actually won't happen if you end up in a, in a siloed environment where your workload is running in a public cloud and it will never come back. 
You know, and I think that's that's really critical for customers is they've got to figure out, well, in three years' time, if that's not the right place for that workload, how easy is it and how effectively can I pull that back to another resource? Yeah, a, a lot of um, reg readers actually, when we run surveys and things, they, they, they're very wary of cloud locking. Um, mm. And, you know, a lot, lot of public cloud services ha have been, have encouraged people to go down the proprietary route in one way or another well, um, at different layers in the stack. And um, uh, that, that the point Peter just mentioned is, is absolutely critical. You might make decisions today to put a cloud service somewhere, but the parameters for that might, might change in the future, whether it's you know, the scope of the thing just changes totally. Um, you've got people from other geographies that need to be accommodated, which have different regulatory requirements or whatever. So you may have to switch from one service provider to another just to deal with regulatory requirements, for but example. There's, I mean, an example question is one, uh, one here for uh, Dick who was asking, um, is the would the hybrid cloud support real-time applications? You know, and if so, well, how do you specify the SLA on these sort of things? This is a typical sort of question that's yep. coming up where you've got some real world problem here and you're trying to think where does it fit? So, so I think um, as a consumer you, you've got to do some work to understand what is the SLA behind the application that I'm running. Um, mm. you know, some examples would be a, a test and dev environment probably has a lower SLA than, than a consumer database or a, or a web engine. So I, I think Within an organisation, you probably know that already. Maybe you're not in touch with the individuals that have responsibility for that application, but I think you can get to a point where you understand the SLA. But suddenly you're managing an SLA across a hybrid environment, and that's mm -hmm. a completely different order of magnitude of difficulty, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. So I think it's important about classifying where, where the workloads sit and where, where is most important. Some workloads you will be able to deliver under a hybrid environment, others you would only ever reside them in a private yeah. or a public instance. This might be um, one of this might be one of them. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I think importantly, um, you know, we're talking about kind of brokering of services here rather than necessarily bursting. I don't see many clients that are going to run an application across, um, you know, both private and public as a running application. I see them putting it in one or the other as we stand at the moment. Mm -hmm. And when the maturity of both of those platforms lifts on either side, then then I see that capability to. To share resources, as long as you could, yeah, as long as at that point you can do that. Now let's go to poll. Let's let's have poll. Explain the poll, Dale, to us as you're our pollster. Okay, so the question is, uh, if if you're in this kind of hybrid environment where essentially you've got um, uh, applications and assets um, spread across organisational boundaries, mm -hmm. so that might be internal, but but obviously between your internal environment and and different cloud service providers. Um, what, what are the kind of basics that you need in place to, to manage this? So we've got three options here and we, we want to know how important you, you, you see these being. So one of them is tools to help you just coordinate what you put where, the provisioning and management of the so management of, of tools, workloads. you've got yeah. something on a pane of glass in front of you. As Peter was saying, you know, you, 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 you want freedom and you want as much flexibility as possible to, um, to put things in the right kind of place but also to later move them around if, if, um, if, if that's necessary. Mm. Um, so that's our first option. The second option is about APIs and standards um, that give you the kind of visibility that you need to manage that kind of SLA problem that the question was about a minute mm -hmm. ago. Um, so uh, I always think of SLAs at, at two levels. One of them is uh, you, you want to control as much as you can in terms of what that SLA is dependent upon. But if there's certain elements that are not within your control, then you at least want as much visibility as possible into how those are running, so you can um, uh, you can anticipate problems and, and get alerts and so on, um, mm -hmm. and, and do some. It's very much a question of appetite of how much you want to get into this exactly. APIs. Though, so, yeah. so, so th there's APIs there um, which, which allow uh, various cloud environments to exchange information, you know, management information uh, with each other, uh, performance information, and so on. And the standards are emerging in that space. So, so that's that's the second option three. And the third one is actually to deal with this idea of optimizing, um, optimizing your environment on the fly. So that this is really about automation. It's about taking that manual administration, manual management and monitoring and saying, okay, well, you know, let, let's actually allow the system to ramp up the resources for a workload or wind them back down again. 
in extreme cases, maybe even move a workload from, from one location to another. But without telling you, or just telling you that it's done? Just it. informing you that that's what it's just done. Mm -hmm. so, so that's obviously the extreme, and a yeah. lot of people are painting that kind of vision. Um, but it'd be interesting to see what, what the readers think. Okay, in terms so of point one, management, you can see what's going on. Point two, the APIs and the standards, so you can investigate the plumbing of what's going on, you understand that. Third one, not getting involved with that stuff at all, I want it automated for me, I want someone else to do it. Peter, yeah. for example, would be one of those people. And so it's really, it's, it's a, and really it's a poll on how much they trust you, Peter. Okay. So yeah, look forward. No, to seriously. It. <laughs> now, yeah, vote. Yeah. So please, please vote for us. We'll let you know what you said at the end. We had the, we did some. You did something similar with the Reg audience a little while ago. So let's see if that. Yeah, uh, yeah. Let's see if that matches see if it's moved at all. Yeah. So uh, there we go. Poll time. Let's see how that works. Meanwhile, on with the uh, on with our Regcast and uh, your peacock diagram here, Dale. It, this really. Um, looks at everything that Reg readers have said should go into a, a cloud platform, yes? Yeah, we've been talking to Reg readers through surveys and various other mechanisms for about four years on cloud now. About, um, I think it was about a year and a half ago or so, we, we actually said to Reg readers, well, look, let, let's talk about the vision for the data center. Yeah. And you know, we've already said that cloud is going to be an important part of that. And uh, most people agree uh, that, that, that there's not really much debate. Um, there is around the edges, but, but not, not in the mainstream. Um, so if you can do that, and it's going to be a hybrid environment, which everyone says, then if you're going to put a cloud platform in place to manage that, then, then what, what, what attributes do, does it need? And what this diagram does is, I mean, there's, there's loads of charts. If you want to go and pull, uh, research, you don't go through all of them. There's loads of charts that that, that sit behind this. Yeah. But but very very um, very. I, brief. I, I, I know what, what you like when you get going. I know, on one I, know of these, I know I know I know. Yeah yeah. So you have I to mean, pick out the stuff. most important ones. Yeah. Yeah. Well, without actually picking them out, even I mean, what what people are saying, if you look at some of these options, are it's got to be virtualized. You know, it's got to be the software defined thing, as you would say nowadays. Uh, it's got to be highly resilient. For obvious reasons, mm -hmm. um, you don't want to take the thing down, so you've got to, it's got to support in-flight management, um, and and that at that kind of basic level, people are pretty clear on what they want. They want a scalable, virtualized environment that um, that's, that's highly resilient. Everyone right? offers me that. Everyone, yeah, it, exactly. everyone offers me that. So, so so that's your basics, but there are also some some interesting um, additional bits in here that I think Peter has got. Some, yeah, what yeah, what, some what jumps on. out at you there, Peter? So I think there's probably um, three things that jump out at me in, in terms of what we're investing in and what we're driving forward. And, and, and the first one is the rapid automating, automated provisioning. Mm -hmm. um, so that's about, I guess, you know, deploying infrastructure in the shortest possible time. I should have it templated, created, ready to go. Um, then we've also focused on the IT team and the self-service capability. Because I don't, I don't think you will truly derive a great deal of benefit from cloud unless you create the self-service concept. Mm -hmm. um, because in effect, that's what most new people coming into IT are used to now. You know, they're used to accessing a screen, downloading an app, seeing a consumer interface. So our customers and our internal users expect a similar thing from IT, um, and that's really what we're trying to drive towards in terms of the, you know, the consumer look and feel of what we do. And then the third thing we spent a lot of time on is the external resource integration, um, which goes back to some of our comments earlier around you know kind of managing those. Those different environments and pulling them together. Mm -hmm. Now, how close, Dale, are we to realising this sort of capability now with what's available? Uh, you can do it all, basically, at one level or another. It's just that different people do it in different ways, and um, mm -hmm. uh, you know, some of it's done in a fairly sort of closed, proprietary way. Uh, other times, you, you've got almost uh, first-generation style of, of, of services that, that do the job, but maybe not that that elegantly. And um, uh, di different vendors have different strengths and weaknesses in terms of as, as, as you work how, how do I know if I've got a problem? So, uh, so what, I'm, um, what I don't get at the moment is how do I know that there's some urgency to sort this one out? If I'm just building my cloud environment and I'm trying some things, and as we pointed out before, the sorts of cloud services I might have built would come out of different projects that have been running in different places. At the moment, I don't see that there's the hypothetical me who's doing this doesn't really see that there's any crisis. Well, that, that's um, it depends on how far you've got on your um, uh, cloud adoption path. 
Um, so those that have actually got a fair way down, they absolutely see there's a problem. I mean, they're... they're what can't they do? That's the thing. Uh, they, they Fundamentally, can't manage, which of these things can't they, they have? They can't manage cost and risk. Um, so the overhead of managing multiple environments in different ways using different tool sets is, is starting to, to kill them from, from a, just, just from an overhead perspective. The, the other thing is um, when, you're, when you're trying to manage things across multiple disjointed environments, um, you miss things as well. There, there, there are certain things that are just going to sneak, sneak through. You know, maybe um, propagating some security policy or, or you overlook some compliance requirement or whatever it happens to be. Um, and uh, that, that's becoming more of an issue now. And in fact, business people are, are, are a lot hotter now on securing compliance than they used to be maybe even five years ago. So um, there's a lot of stuff coming from the top down and, and it's hard to answer those questions when you've only got partial control and partial visibility looking across multiple silos. So um, uh, there's, there's some re very real problems there. The other thing is lock-in. Uh, people are finding that, um, that they, they've, they, they've maybe sort of bought into certain silo characteristics and what they've ended up with is for whatever reason, they've outgrown that, that, that's, that silo. And that's unlikely to be scalability. It's more likely to be that it doesn't support certain kind, it doesn't tick certain boxes in terms of you know, risk and compliance and so on. Um, but it's very difficult for them to, to actually move that workload now or, or that application. Uh, so the, there's, ironically, whilst cloud is promoted very, very heavily on flexibility, what they've ended up doing is creating creating quite a rigid environment. So when someone comes along and says, we now want this to work together with this, or um, we want this to work in a different way, it, it actually becomes quite constrained. You ask the question, there's no immediate answer from the people you're buying the services. Yeah. Yeah. I think, in, interestingly on that, that, you know, the operational visibility is something that I see as a key challenge across uh, customers at the moment, in that they've got uh, environments and workloads running in the public cloud, they've got some running inside their data center. Do they actually know which one is the most cost effective? Uh, and most of the time, the perception is that on the far right, public cloud is the cheapest. But actually, when you build it out over many, many years and add on lots of extra features around security and availability and on and on and on, it becomes less cost effective. So I think we're, in the industry in general, we're struggling for that kind of common, common metric, if you like, for somebody to analyse, you know, if my workload sits here, does it provide me with, with all my SLA requirements, but also the lowest cost? Mm -hmm. And I think as an organisation and industry, we've got a little way to go on that at the moment. Well, I mean, that is quite a complicated calculation to make, to be able to talk about the lowest cost for service mm -hmm. across all these different things. Do you get that? I mean, we often find that we went through this process with virtualization, for example, yeah. where uh, we went through this process in regcasts about virtualization, where first we were optimistic and then we started doing regcasts about how you fix the problems that jumping into virtualization has caused for you. Are we at that stage yet for some of the people who come to you, Peter, with their cloud services where disillusionment has set in? I think we're probably not just there just yet, but I, You're it's, getting it's, in it's ahead not, of the market. <laughs> it's not far on the horizon, shall we say? And, and again, that, that becomes, you know, back to some of Dale's comments around if you end up in that proprietary stack um, where there's no opportunity to move elsewhere, then it, it does become a real challenge. Um, and, and, and perhaps another way to answer that is we might not necessarily know about the problem until it's too late um, because we don't have a view of that. We can't take that holistic view of, of, of where my workload sits and where it's best to reside. <laughs> yeah, ironically, it's the ones that have made most investments that are actually discovering the problems. And I agree with you. It's, I don't think we've got to the point of disillusionment. I think we've got to the point of we need to... This isn't going to stop. This is going to get more complex and more um, challenging if we let the trend continue. So we've got to do some. We've got to stem this um, fragmentation now before it actually gets out of control. Uh, and uh, I, I think sometimes it's quite hard for people that haven't actually done that much with cloud to to appreciate this because it's great, isn't it? I mean, you 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 got a problem. You got the business breathing down your neck saying. We want this delivered really quickly. So you just go bosh, 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 and you take the, the closest fit cloud service. And you don't think about what you're going to end up with when you do this five, six, seven, 10, 20, 50 times um, in five years' time. What, what's, what's that going to end up with? 
Good. So, yeah. you know, if there is a anyone uh, on outside yeah, so who's come up against these specific problems, we'd like to know exactly what those are because that would be extremely helpful. So let us know via the you know via the question uh, you know via the questions comments exactly what those problems are that you're coming up against first if you've put this effort in and it has become you know and you have reached this point because uh, then we can also yeah we can maybe be helpful we'll try anyway Peter, this is the way in which HP is trying to be helpful about it, isn't it? Yes, absolutely. So our, our cloud system um, portfolio is part of the wider brand, and, and it's the software. So Helion's the big thing. Helion's the big thing. This is one of the products that sits in it. Cloud system. Like. Yeah. What's what's cloud system? So cloud system is the software that we sell the to software. allow the uh, allow automation and orchestration of, of, of infrastructure and uh, potentially applications as well. Mm -hmm. So it's that that overriding software piece and. When we've developed it, we've focused on a couple of simple things. One is that we build it for a hybrid world, as we've, we've already discussed, so that we can um, allow workload placement. And two is we built it on the OpenStack architecture to allow that open connectivity. And um, I guess we talked to the start about how sometimes this market gets a bit complex and there's lots of different opinions. You know, there's really two key things we're focusing on. One is that we make the installation experience um, you know, much, much easier for a consumer. So we install this as almost like a virtual appliance. Secondly, we focus on how does this enable us, uh, or us as an organization, to deliver fast infrastructure in, in, in a matter of minutes rather than hours or days. So we're about kind of predefining stuff and building it um, day one, rather than, rather than kind of going back to the drawing board each is, there, is there an appetite for this delivered as an appliance thing? Because isn't this some of what gets us into the problems people buying cloud appliances. Yeah, so perhaps I'll, I'll rephrase that. In, yeah. in terms of an appliance, I don't mean a set of infrastructure with software built on top. I mean a, I mean a kind of a, a virtual machine that runs the software, if you like. So yeah. it can be installed onto an existing environment, as, as we'll mention in a short while, Okay. Yeah. Um, and then move forward from there. So I guess I just wanted to pick up on three, three points we're, we're delivering on here to perhaps explain a little bit more about the software. The first thing is, in terms of the automated provisioning that we discussed on the last, on Dale's uh, Peacock slide. Mm. And we talked about how, how does the software enable us to quickly provision infrastructure. So there's a couple of key things we work on here. One is that in, in the software we create the concept of a designer or an architect. And there's a tool in the software that allows you to structure a, a template, if you like, that says for this particular environment, I will use this number of VMs or this, no, this type of storage, I'll connect it to this network. And you know, you almost build up like a blueprint of the design. It builds it for you, yeah. So you, you kind of give it some mm -hmm. intuitive information, but it's, it's almost like a Visio diagram where you're dragging and dropping the components and putting them together. What sort of information do you give it? What's, do, what do you say to uh, it? So typically you'd give it uh, parameters in terms of the number of virtual machines that you think are applicable, the mm. type of storage, perhaps the associated costs behind those products which network you connect it to, and, and then what software you layer over the top. Uh -huh. um, probably the big advantage that we deliver here is that we also offer some pre-built templates from HP under the banner of Cloud Maps. Um, so essentially that's where we've taken our IP and done a lot of the hard work for the customer. So they can download a pre-built service, um, edit it in small fashion, and then move on and, and deploy that service. Uh -huh. And I think, um, the other thing that's really critical around the automated provisioning aspect is that we create a difference between the service that we build and an offering that we pass to the, the end consumer, if you like. And what I mean by that is there should be a small number of service blueprints and then a number of different offerings that we pitch out to different parts of the business. And that's really what we're trying to do. And, and let me just, I guess, give a kind of live example of that. So for example, for the test and dev development environment or the application builders, you may well want to give them a bit of flexibility to choose the operating system, to choose the level of memory. For another user in the marketing team, you know, you may well just give them one option. You, yeah. know, you choose what's on the list or you don't have it. And that's the kind of, you know, the way we, we can approach different things. So that's absolutely critical because you won't drive cost savings unless you keep that kind of common common template. And then the other thing we focus on is the self-service capability. So that was one of the points on the chart. And I think this, um, this brings a lot of interesting points for most consumers and, and most internal IT function. 
And, and I think the important thing is here, you can start small and grow big. So it can be just used as a, a method of the IT team controlling what's deployed when, um, getting an understanding of which departments are using which services and how much they're paying for them. Um, but you can start small and then move to the full kind of, you know, marketplace portal further down the line. And the third thing I picked on was, we talked on that chart about the external um, resource and integration with it. So again, we've spent a lot of effort in cloud system and a lot of effort with OpenStack in building together that connectivity with some of the external cloud providers. So it's, it's there out of the box. Um, and I think the other thing with OpenStack is it's, it's designed for then people to write their own connectivity tools on top of that as well. Yeah, we're going into OpenStack in more sure. detail in a few sure. minutes, aren't we? Because I know we've already got um, an OpenStack uh, question in here, so we'll just you know we'll just hold on to that one because it's going to be good. The, there is one here. There's a TCO question or a return on investment sure. question here. Does this sort of thing that you're doing help uh, help people to model? the TCO of whatever cloud service or whatever cloud environment they're building for themselves. Because if you can't model that, it's very hard to then work out what your commitment to resources is going to be. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. And I, th I think it's a big, um, a big focus of what we're doing here by creating these templated services is hmm. to build an attributed cost behind that service. Um, so we assume a cost of a virtual machine, we assume a cost of the storage that goes with that. So I could then build up an overall cost of that service that I'm delivering and mm. compare that if, against if I was to buy the infrastructure from, from you, if you like. I see, and, and also, yes, that gives you a sort of a what if, doesn't it? Yeah. It gives you the sort of counterfactual. Now, Sashin's question is a good question, this mm. one. Dale, about you, on, on TCO, this, this is a problem, isn't it, when we're building these, this sort of amount of flexibility and you know, something with this amount of moving parts? Yeah. I, um, it's useful to think of TCO at an infrastructure level, which is quite often eluded lots of um, organizations, just, just figuring out how much the physical infrastructure is, is, is costing you and, and maybe the platform software layer. That becomes much easier in, in a cloud environment because you're viewing it as a, as, as a whole and you, you, you can look across the piece and get metrics and so on. Um, the the it also gives you metrics which allow you to then start looking at TCO because the thing that really matters to, to business people is TCO of the actual service it delivered which yes. is usually includes the application piece as well yeah um, and again having metrics and visibility um, it gives you a lot of uh, a, a lot a lot more ability to um, to actually do the sums the the other point I would make is uh, we come across a lot of organisations who are struggling with the whole allocation model of, of, of cost back out to the business because quite rightly you know you end up with um, one business unit saying yeah but we don't consume as much as these guys down the road hmm. and it's a you know it's artificial to do it on headcount or off square footage or, or whatever um, when, when you have the kind of visibility that you have here you can you can more quickly move into a, a sort of at least a showback mechanism so you can adjust costs periodically we don't see very many people going down the actual chargeback mechanism. That that's that's the exception rather than rule at the moment, but it does give you a lot more in the way of um, how you manage um, costs and make costs visible to the business. And this is a huge thing actually for business execs. They don't know, how, you know, they, they they see the overall IT budget, but they really don't know what they're getting for their money. And so th this is at least the first step towards allowing them to. Hmm. understand that and I think I was just going to add on on the TCO question that you know one of the ways of delivering major benefit here is creating repeatable services um, you know many organizations will deploy the same kind of workload and application time after time and, and what we're trying to do with templates and cloud is really stop that happening different every time yeah, yeah. so actually your your day one TCO by implementing a, a template and a kind of cloud map may be good but your year two, year three is even better because you're stopping that redesign each time. Mm. Now, Andy is asking here, uh, how much is available now? And actually, some of what Andy's asking we're going to get into because uh, he's talking about what level of multi-vendor integration and management's available. We're going to be onto that in a couple of minutes' time, aren't we? I seem to recall. But uh, he's saying, um, so you've got, a, you've got a roadmap. How much of what you're delivering now on this HP cloud system and in Helios is available now and how much of it is aspirational? Sure, so I guess um, in terms of the integration with external resources, that's there and available today. 
um, the separation from the hardware and the software so that we don't need to take it down a single proprietary hardware route is there today. Um, so I think majority of the, the information that we've been talking about today is there. Yeah. If I refer back to Dale's, Dale's kind of chart, the, the one thing I think we're missing is that kind of holistic view of the, the different costs associated across the, yeah. the multiple hybrid environments. That's, so, gonna, that's an important thing to get to, yeah, isn't it? Yeah, and yeah. I, I don't think we get that until we create standards. But no. yeah, certainly the automated provisioning and most of the topics we've discussed today are, are there in the software ready to go. All right, I hope that helps you. And now, let's have a look at OpenStack. I'm always interested in OpenStack. Uh, Dale, this is your slide. Yeah, so um, we, we talked about your cloud platform, um, yeah. how, 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 how that's been defined. Um, there, there are a number of vendors, five, six vendors, maybe, maybe more that can provide a pretty comprehensive solution to do most of what we've been talking about at one level or another. But most of them are proprietary, so, yeah. so you're ending up with a, a sort of top to bottom um, set of uh, very vendor specific solutions, you know, right through to management tools and um, uh, sometimes internal standards within the the, the environment mm. or uh, the, you know the way it works internally. So that's not sustainable as for, for all the kind of reasons that that we've discussed. It's not really sustainable over the longer term. Um, so one of the things that is is, is a, a basic principle be, behind OpenStack is saying, well, look, there's a whole bunch of real, of, of common functionality that sits behind every cloud. You know, some of the things that I was mentioning earlier on, yeah. every cloud ha has to do this. So, so let's define some, that capability um, in a, um, a, a an open standards manner. Um, and, and in fact, with OpenStack, it's all open source as well. Um, and then use that as a starting point for building clouds. Uh, so that's the idea behind OpenStack in a nutshell. So it's not claiming necessarily to do everything that you want to do in a cloud environment, but at least it's it, it's it's giving a very very good foundation, uh, and then vendors pick up from there. Yeah. And I mean, I think it's important. OpenStack is all about creating a community model, so that different organisations contribute code back to the wider business. Mm. So that's kind of the the principle of what we created here, almost like uh, you know Linux did in the market, where a number of organisations took Linux code, supported it as an entity and then sold it as a proposition. But so OpenStack is fundamentally different though because there's so many more parts to OpenStack, aren't there? It yeah. becomes a much more difficult thing to manage that contributing back and creating something that makes a whole. So, so yeah, I, I would agree. I mean, certainly it's, it's more complicated than deploying an operating system, which is obviously what we do in, in, in a Linux environment. But I think you know our, our approach is is pretty simple to OpenStack. Is that if you if you know the system well and you know what OpenStack is, it's based of a series of modules um, that provide compute, orchestration, network connectivity, and each of those modules has their own set of codes that are tested and developed. And what we're doing at HP is where that module is mature enough, mm -hmm. we take that module and we integrate it with our software. Where it doesn't yet have the maturity, we supplement it with some of the existing HP. Um, parts of our portfolio, um, and then we continue to contribute to the code to get it. I'm going to say you're going to keep efficient. contributing that. Yeah, back. absolutely. Yeah, yeah, and, and that's that's the whole part of a community model. Um, so, so we've developed some connectivity options for fibre channel storage um, within the OpenStack portfolio. That's been contributed back to the community, and now other vendors are also using that because um, that's the only way you build this open standards mm. approach. Absolutely. Uh, can I just, Marius is just asking, can he use the HP um, Helion OpenStack, the free version of that, so that he can experiment building, uh, so building his cloud using his, he's got some uh, HP microservers at home. Wow. He's okay. do it at home. Yeah. So that, that could be an interesting cloud it's, of microservers. It should be the sort of thing yeah. you should be encouraging. Yeah. <laughs> so, so absolutely, the, um, the, the free version, that the community model that we have is available yeah. on the website to download. Um, it is absolutely designed for kind of POC and test environments mm -hmm. um, and, and up to about 30, 30 different compute nodes that we support in it. So yeah, so that's exactly the type of uh, offering it's for. Yeah. Great. So, so Marius, give it a go and let us know how you get on with that. Probably not by the end of today. You won't have time to have so done much. But please, yeah, do let us know when we put the on-demand up. Maybe give us a comment about that because, uh, and that's a, I mean, that's sort of activity that if OpenStack is going to succeed, this is the sort of activity that needs to be going on because that's what carried Linux through in the early days, isn't it, Dale? 
Yeah, and, and uh, th th there is an important principle as well, which P Peter kind of alluded to, which is the idea of modularization. It essentially, OpenStack is a set of components, but the components themselves obviously have value in that they're they're, they're developed through through communities. Um, but actually, one of one of the most important parts of of, of that is that that there's a set of APIs around each each component, so everything plugs together in a very predefined way. And that's where you get a lot of the ability to substitute. So if you want to actually replace one component with a, um, a go faster one, that, that, that's easy enough to do in, in, in principle, provided you stick to, to the APIs and standards. So my own view on this is that I think the, the standards around OpenStack are as important as the actual software in OpenStack itself. That's, that's not to you know, diminish the importance of the software, and the work that people are doing, but I think we, we shouldn't overlook the, the standardization sort of the, component. The structure that it gives yeah. to the, the activity that other people might make, uh, that might build around I, it. Yeah. And, and, and that's why the community can, can really sort of go for it and um, you know, re really add lots yeah. of value. Would you, would you like to see ways? sort of more upfront wider commitment to OpenStack rather than all this excitement around the proprietary Cloud um, I, I mean, environments that we're getting now. It's an interesting question. I guess th th there's a lot of people talking about what they're doing with OpenStack, but few actually delivering behind the scenes. That's a frustration, um, isn't it? Because it, it means that we end up reporting, you yeah. know, these sort of uh, doomsday scenarios about OpenStack that it might just run out of steam because yeah. it's very hard work. I think there's some significant vendors, including HP, behind the philosophy now. So I'm, I'm certain it won't run out of steam. I guess there's going to be some vendors that want to take that route and other vendors that are interested in, in, in selling a proprietary stack for obvious reasons. Mm. Um, so some will take with us, some, some will fall by the wayside. And I think the, you know, the focus in HP is that we're, we're delivering this now. You know, we, use, uh, we use OpenStack to run our public cloud, so we're operating it at scale. We understand the challenges that go with it, uh, I guess the security problems, and, and we can then use that IP and add that back into our, our software that we resell to our, our customers. Yeah. So there's a big difference between talking about it and actually delivering and operating it, as, as we always know. Yes. And I think there's a big thing about critical mass as well, which you've sort of indirectly referred to. And um, uh, the, the, I think there's enough interest and commitment now amongst the service provider community mm -hmm. um, to OpenStack, which means that it's going to find its way into organizations through that kind of route, through public cloud services. You have some pretty big players, not just HP, but Rackspace, obviously, mm -hmm. and, and others. Um, are heading in that direction, um, or, and are already, you know, delivering services today. And as you look to um, the, the hybrid piece, then um, you know some people will look at the mindset will be extending out the internal system. Other times it will be, well, can we instantiate that kind of cloud that we started out creating in the service provider environment in, in our own environment? Because for this particular application area, for instance, or part of the business, um, we, we, we've got different considerations. Um, but but keeping the architecture consistent, so you can see that there are um, there are different routes in, into the organisation, and I think the philosophy is one of do you do you kind of helicopter up and take a, a broader view, or do you continue just investing in your original virtualization platform, which you then sort of added some additional management capability to, and ultimately you you build a private cloud. Yeah, you know, we're talking about the Microsoft VMware um, yeah. stacks here, obviously. Um, and there's nothing wrong with that necessarily, but um, the danger is that you are actually um, b building these. these as long as you've got to root out yeah. from that, if you decide. And actually, this, this brings us on to here, doesn't it? This brings on to what you're doing with uh, your conception of openness within the world that exists already. Pete. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I guess I wanted to cover two two important points here. One is the kind of changing role for our customers, if you like. So, so we talk about. Um, a different approach to different roles. So I think one of the interesting parts is you change individuals within the business from administrators of infrastructure, so you know server storage and networking and administrators, into more of an architect function where they're actually designing services. Um, now I think if if we were to poll the guys on the on the webcast today, majority of them would want to move into that type of role where they're not designing individual bits of infrastructure. They're designing services that contribute back to the business. Mm -hmm. So I think that's important. That's one of the first things, and and we should recognise that that already happens inside a business. You know, when somebody goes to deploy a new exchange system or a new set of web servers, there is still a design that that team works to. The challenge is in most situations it's not formalised, 
or if it is formalized, it's, it takes a long time to be done. And then when we go to repeat the same process in two years time for another part of the business, we'll probably do it in a slightly different way. So here we're trying to get to kind of that architect role to formalize it. And there's a lot of focus in the software on how we deliver that. Mm. I think you've also got the consumer role changes uh, dramatically. Um, so I said right back at the start, I think we talked about the perception of new users coming into the market that want you know, an, an app to access things, are used to simple click and hear and provision mm. systems. You know, we are absolutely investing in the software to deliver that at the moment. Um, and we can either we can either go full fully to a marketplace portal that we, we, we set up for an organization, or we can just use it to control stuff in the first instance. So there's different levels that you can deliver there. And then I think you've got the administration function. So I've created all these services, I've got these services built. Um, how many of them are running? How many of them are running at full capacity? You've got all these kind of analytics that can go on in the background. Um, and you know, wouldn't it be great if we could if we build a service day one and then we find out in three or four months time that we're not using all of that capacity and perhaps we redesign that service to make it a smaller number of virtual machines or a lower tier of storage you know again that's where we bring the, the TCO and the economics well that's that, that's an interesting thing you might not be able to calculate and plan your exact TCO to report mm -hmm. back but if you've got the visibility for that you know that you can make some move yep. that will improve your situation and if you've got enough visibility of what you're doing and the management capability there, you can always keep improving. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You might not know exactly what your the, what your optimal situation would be, yeah. but you can optimize. You, you can, and, and the whole principle of what we're trying to drive towards here is this concept of pools of resources. So mm. I have my, my compute, my storage, my network, and, and I should be able to go and grab resources when I need it, drop it when I don't, and, and, and you know develop it and change it. Yes. So, so the other important point just on here is around the ability to deploy across many environments. So we started this webcast off with talking about an open cloud. Um, these, these are some of the ways that we're doing it inside HP. So I think the, the simple principle is we, we are open from an operating system layer. Uh, so we support a number of different operating systems in the environment. We are open from a hypervisor layer. So that's your virtualization layer on top of the, on top of the hardware. We're also open standards from an application point of view. Now, it might not be right for a customer to go to application delivery day one. Uh, they might want to start at the infrastructure level, but again, we have that option in the portfolio. And then we've already spoken about the public cloud um, mm -hmm. connectivity. So we're not interested in, I guess, pushing one over the other. Our job is to try and support as many of the options as we oh, can. Plus the, the fact your customers are there already ahead of you and you have to come and meet them really, don't yeah, you? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, a number of those technologies are already being used in the market. So yes, we have to embrace them, absolutely. Yeah. And so it's, you know, this sort of, uh, this rather sort of covers that situation, doesn't it? The existing infrastructure that we've got is what we're going to have to deal with. And uh, you're saying it's perfectly legitimate that have that existing infrastructure. You're not saying to people, you need to start a move to an open stack environment now. No, I don't think there's necessarily a need to entirely replace the infrastructure that you've got. Obviously, mm -hmm. there's a debate to be had about whether the infrastructure is quick enough and fast enough and it needs a refresh, but that's, a, that's an ongoing discussion. Yeah. Um, so, so I would suggest that we, you know, we, we try and approach the software from an ability to, to manage existing resources as well as net new resources um, mm -hmm. on the platform, and that's what we're trying to do. Yeah. We're at last call on the on the poll, by the way. If you've worked out what your answer's going to be now, you ought to put it in because we need a couple of minutes at the end. We've only got a few minutes to go, but we need a couple of minutes at the end to find out what you've said, whether or not it's just, yeah, management, APIs or automation that's going to be the, that is the thing for you. I, I, I'm introducing your question here, Dale. I know you spend hours thinking these things up and I just sort of like say what no, I think I've heard. Pretty much. Yeah, all right. Well, that's good to know, isn't it? Now, it's, Peter's worked very hard, so we'll give him his, uh, so we'll give him his Forrester slide here, which shows that your, your bubble is close to the heart of the sun here. Yes, our bubble is close to the top right-hand corner, which is always a, a pleasant place to be. So this is a um, Forrester um, analytics report on private cloud. Um, and, and vendors in the market that produce those products. And I think just you know a quick summary, you, you'll see the white paper afterwards, but we've got a strong presence in the market yeah. and seen as having a strong offering. And I think they pick out a couple of interesting things in the portfolio. One is the um, self-service capability. So the scope and I guess the, uh, the ability of the portal and the way it can be customized. 
and then also the integration with third parties. So they're creating that wider ecosystem of what we do. So those are the those are the two or three things that Forrester pick out. Um, you know, this report was produced, I think, towards the end of 2013, and, and we've made some big changes and announcements since, since then. So I hope we can uh, strengthen our position in the market. Yeah, that's it. Let's just wrap this up with what you're doing with HP Cloud System. I, I, you know, we, we talked about a lot of things now, and everyone's at a different level with this, aren't they? I mean, I, I guess you're, you're dealing with people, some people who've been in it for years, and some people who really are making the first step now. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and this, this chart is really just to yeah. say that we, we can take a customer on a step-by-step -step journey. So if you want to just start with you know, virtualization and automation, there's some, some infrastructure and appliances stacks that we can sell there. And you can see the different flavors of cloud system that we've, we've got on the market. I guess the really important point is that infrastructure and that um, the approach to the management tools is very consistent across the space. So you can move from one to the other. Uh, you know, w without too much ch too much of a challenge. Mm -hmm. Now, the results you'll be pleased to know the results of the poll are in. So we've got yeah, so uh, yeah, and we have first of all tools. I'm going to give you the criticals first. Tools, okay. tools, critical, fifty percent. APIs critical, thirty six percent. Automation critical only eight percent. So automation, far less important than the other two. Dale, does this surprise you? No, it's pretty much what I would expect. Uh, it, it's moving through that confidence cycle mm -hmm. of um, manual control through more visibility through ultimately to um, aut automation across the board. So. And, and looking at the other end of the scale on the not useful at the far end, then um, automation again is the by far the highest, yeah. almost 14% on automation is not useful, where it's only uh, less than 3% on either APIs or tools. So yeah, it's, yeah. Peter, this again, this is what you're expecting, the top two? Well, certainly I expected APIs to be, be high on the, uh, the, the score mm -hmm. list or the score sheet. Um, and I think as we, we discussed throughout the conversation today, management tools are critical because there's a kind of an old adage in terms of you can't you can't measure what you can't uh, you know you can't if you can't manage something you can't measure it you can't make the decisions on the back yeah, of it. Yeah, so. absolutely. If you add APIs and tools together, if you add the um, the criticals and the importance together, then we're getting up to about eighty five percent on both yeah, of them. Yeah, that's kind of yes. as you would expect. Yeah. yeah. So uh, so so the, those two very high automation is yet not really in the same not really mm -hmm. in the same game. Well, that's terrific. I'm glad that experiment worked because that's basically, first of all, that's what you think is important. Yep. I know we discussed this beforehand, but I didn't tell you. And uh, secondly, that's what the Reg audience, that's consistent with what the Reg audience has said before. I'll tell you what's interesting and what's different here from previous research is that last one, automation. Mm. Um, if I look between the 8% on one end and the 14% at the other end, there's quite a lot in the middle mm. that... Important at least of thinking about it, which yeah. um, a lot of people previously have been dismissing that as, no, that's a step too far. It's about, yeah, it's more than 40%. It's interesting, it's more it's important. Yeah. yeah, so that's, you know, so it's coming on to the agenda on, on that. So let's uh, wrap this up with a bit of further, uh, the bit of further reading, because there is something also interesting here for the, uh, for the Reg audience, there's an HP Cloud event that they can go to. Yes, Where, there what's, is. what's happening with um, this then? So, so Tuesday next week, Tuesday the fifth of June. Oh, no, no, um, not, not much London. notice, please. No, me. no, but it's uh, you know I'd like to extend extend the invitation to anyone that's on the webcast today. Uh, we'll also be demonstrating the software um, and talking you through how it works and how we install it and how we set it up. So if you want to see it working, you want to see the kind of proof in the pudding behind what we talked about today then uh, feel free to register for the event. Um, we've got a small number of places left, but you know, get on the site and register now. Well, it's one of these two blokes is saying to the other, you put in the postcode for the Mermaid Theatre wrong, didn't you? <laughs> <laughs> that definitely doesn't look like central London, that's I for sure. Still, so. Yes, <laughs> I said Blackfriars. When I came through Blackfriars this morning, it did not look like that. That's for, that, 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 that's for sure. So to, um, to wrap up on this one, um, Dale, for people who, are, for anyone who's recognizing themselves in this regcast, they want to go out to the, you know, now to do something about this, get this problem of the emerging proprietary silos, cloud silos sorted. What's the first step? Uh, the first step is to do, do an honest uh, or a, an assessment of where you are at the moment. And I think um, people that I've encouraged to do that in the past have actually been quite surprised at how much 
fragmentation they have accumulated, how many different clouds they've accumulated. And, and that, I think, then puts you in a position to know the extent of the problem and how it's growing uh, and likely to grow over time. Yeah, and Peter, for, you, for your point of view, doing that, how far can they get down the road um, using, uh, you know, using what's at their disposal now and how much does this involve them making different commercial decisions? So I think they can take uh, you know, some quite simple, easy steps with, with limited investment at the moment. Um, you know, we can try the software in a POC environment. Mm -hmm. um, I, I would say you know, tackle the, the easy things first, which is building some of these templated services and being able to respond back to the business quicker. Yeah. Um, the kind of the self-service piece and the portals and the, and the brokerage with external resources, that's probably phase two for most customers. But get it in, prove that you can develop the architects and, and, and the templates, and then you'll start delivering some returns and savings back to the business. Okay. Yeah, a word that springs to mind is, is discipline. There's a lot of discipline in this kind of approach. There is. There. It is yeah. trying to include, in, introduce a little bit of discipline into what previously has been arguably a bit of a free-for-all. So. Free for all, yeah. There's no such thing as a permanent free for all, is there? <laughs> no, absolutely. <laughs> I didn't know quite where I was going with that when I got to the middle of it. Thanks very much, guys. We're out of time. So uh, please let us know what you thought of this uh, Regcast. Thank you very much for taking part in our poll. I thought that was a useful exercise. We'll maybe do, we'll do that again. We'll start asking you more and more questions. In the end, then maybe you could just do the whole thing for yourselves. <laughs> <laughs> you won't need us anymore. The, um, uh, but uh, we hope this has been useful. Let us know about this. Keep in touch with this. There'll be an on-demand version if you missed any of it or you'd like to uh, watch it again or send it to other people to so watch out for that. Um, meanwhile, join us again for our next RegCast soon. It's a sort of a goodbye from the team who are over there. They put in a lot of work. It's also a goodbye from me. So uh, I've been Tim Phillips from the Reg. Goodbye.